Okay, here we go. Uh, we're back again, the Escapade Show, and today we're joined with Nick Ferguson, good friend, Ibiza promoter, all round legend. How you doing, Nick? Yeah, good, mate. Thank you. That was quite an introduction. Yes. Yeah, it's good to be with friends today. I've done a few of these lately, um, and sometimes they're a little bit kind of slower, a bit more corporate type, but it's nice to chat amongst friends today. Definitely, definitely. It's, been, it's a pleasure to have you on, mate. So, how are you, first and foremost, in these crazy times? How are you getting on? Um, my head's above water. I guess uh, I'm feeling all right. I'm feeling positive. I think you've got to have some kind of perspective. There's people in way, way worse positions. Um, as my best friend keeps reminding me, we're all sharing the same shit sandwich, which I think sums it up quite nicely. Yeah. Um, personally, though, it, it's a very disappointing situation because, uh, you know, I've built a business over the last three years, really from nothing. Um, We'd worked very hard this winter to plan a lot of events. I think we were working on 72 events just this summer in Ibiza and Mallorca. Um, unfortunately, I think the likelihood is now that none of them will actually take place. Wow. Uh, and, you know, the, the effect that that's had on Ibiza, the tourism industry, our staff, our, our clubbers, our customers, um, it's, it's really disappointing for anybody involved in, in Ibiza whole picture of it so I'm feeling disappointed but I'm feeling the whole world is struggling with this and it's selfish to actually kind of feel like we're the only ones suffering yeah so I mean it's affecting absolutely everyone of course is there like light at the end of the tunnel really because we're getting mixed reports from like the press and stuff in terms of is it opening up is it not like can you travel can you not is it safe is it not you know well, as we know, you know, the, the British or the mainstream media are they're poisonous. They're, they're selling stories, clickbait or whatever. So I'd ignore all that. I mean, yeah, look, Ibiza is open. Um, it's still as great place as it ever was. In fact, it's even better. The more quiet it is, the more amazing, you know, the more the magic really shines through, really. You could go to the most stunning beaches in the world now and have somewhere to lie. The restaurants aren't packed. There are still really nice bars open, a really nice vibe. Everyone who's here is very grateful to be here and enjoying being here. Uh, so, yeah, Ibiza's opening. It's happening. Um, the thing is, it's, it's, a, it's a different Ibiza this year. So mm. if people want to come and enjoy uh, an incredible island, this is the time to come and do it. If clubbing is your thing, I think it might be better to sit it out now, unfortunately. If you asked me a week ago, I might have sounded a bit different, but I feel like I'm kind of uh, yeah. got to be a bit more realistic now with the position that that we're in. Um, is there light at the end of the tunnel? I think the answer is definitely yes. I think for the world, the answer has to be yes. I'm sure it'll bounce back. Yeah. Um, I would like to think that there may, might be some level of normality by next year. Do I think we'll retreat to where we were? I don't know. I don't know if they'll ever allow 10,000 strangers to dance together in a room, sweating, drinking, smoking, whatever, ever again. I don't know. Um, that's such a case I think that isn't it like the way it once was it might I mean how revolves long, around that how it long, revolves how long until that, that might you know, make it back yeah. it's hard to put your finger yeah. on it well we took life for granted mate we took our freedom for granted you know who would have thought that we spent three months we couldn't walk down the road you know that, that was that was realistically what was happening we've taken everything for granted I think this is now going to really reset people's minds on how they live and think um, there might be some positives coming from it I'm sure but I, I think we're all going to live in fear now of, of another lockdown and the virus um, developing, uh, you know, and getting worse. But I think we need to stay optimistic and confident that we will all come through it. Um, for Ibiza, Ibiza's bounced back from, from many terrible situations in time. You know, there's, there's been, uh, you know, crashes before. There's been many other places that have come onto the market that everybody's like, oh, wow, Ibiza's dead. It's now Ayanapa, Croatia, even Malta. But Ibiza's always bounced back. It has this phenomenal infrastructure of the best clubs, bars, beaches, food you can reach on this side of the world, possibly the world. Um, and it's very hot on social media. Everyone who's been has had a great time and always returns. So Ibiza's got so much going for it. I've got no doubt Ibiza will bounce back. I just don't know whether the regulation is going to allow partying to the extent that it has yeah. in previous years. Do you think it'll open up a possibility or... Like more ways to do things differently more creative perhaps more outdoor stuff going on and you know just a different outlook on partying in general like over the next few years potentially I, I think yes but you know without getting too deep and political on it there is an agenda there's always been an agenda here from 
um, certain areas of the government that they haven't been comfortable with the tourism uh, model that currently exists. This has been going on over the last 10, 15 years since I've been here, really. You know, 15 years ago or 20 years ago when I started out here, there was noise, there was music everywhere. People could do a party anywhere, anytime. You walked into the sea, there were flyers everywhere. It, yeah. it was messy and chaotic. They've done quite well to clean it since and improve its reputation. But now there, there really is an attack on um, things like the West End. They want to completely gentrify that zone. Um, and they really want more controls over the nightclubs. And now they're very much using this opportunity, like many governments are around the world, they're using this as an opportunity now to really take back control of things that they lost control of under the guise of, you know, well, it's, it's about the virus, we need to protect our local citizens. And I hate to say it, it's total bollocks to a certain extent. Um, you know, yesterday there was a flare up of free people in Menorca and now everybody in Ibiza is going to have to wear a mask and the clubs probably aren't going to be able to operate. You, you know, you've got to look behind this and think what's really going on. And I think this is the main threat to Ibiza actually now, uh, the, the political kind of developments that are coming off the back of this mm. virus more than local people getting really ill, to be honest. Yeah, unfortunately, we always find freedoms get taken away in the name of security. You know, it's uh, that, that's that's not a new thing, unfortunately. And as you see, even with the island, you can see how the tourism side of thing that it would be frowned upon, and they don't get it, they don't understand. So it's like we need to close more of it down, not realizing how impactful that is going to be. Exactly that, mate. And you know, there's there's also one very powerful company or family on this island that control major major things here and they're not opening and um you know unfortunately i feel like they've got enough power to make sure nobody else can open as well mm -hmm. uh, they might be doing it for the right reasons they might not i don't really know but we're, we're really at a point now where um you know the whole economy of the island the whole tourism uh infrastructure here it, it could be really destroyed and it would be catastrophic for many people i'm talking generations of families you know think of like these little spanish families that have um, smaller businesses, I know car hire or little shops around the corner from a hotel, these might not survive. Um, the big, you know, your TUIs, your tour operators, things like that, they'll get through it. They'll get bailed out, you know, that they've got shareholders, they, they'll get through it. They always do. But I think there's going to be a really catastrophic effect on smaller local families. Yeah. Um, and I, I just hope there is a way back. But I, I feel like Ibiza will bounce back positively because people want to be here and there's people always, always going to come here and uh, really work hard to create something. Yeah, I mean, I was uh, considering like just driving over, like you know, the safer options. Like, I'm, I still want to go. The, the buzz taste still come over. Is is still there? You know, as you say, it's 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 got that magic about it. But mm -hmm. it's it's a mad one. It's so uncertain at the moment. Yeah. What? So you you'd mentioned that you had seventy two events in the pipeline, all of being cancelled. So is. Are any of them being moved or are any of them maybe, are you trying to do something virtual or as Stephen said, maybe, you know, outside? Obviously a lot of them probably were outside. So it's like, what are you doing with that? Or is it just flat out, nothing's happened? I mean, we, we, it's been a very much a, a process of waiting for some government news, you know, to be told what the actual regulations are. Now, a lot of the venues and a lot of the promoters and brands, a couple of months ago, they threw the towel in. I totally understood. He, you know, one of the biggest brands I work with said, look, we, we cannot make this work. We can't see it working. And to be honest, they had the foresight to call it early. Um, a couple of the clubs, you know, Eden, Amnesia, the ones I work with the most, they were fighting for it. They, they've got businesses they really wanted to fight to happen. They've got a lot of staff that, you know, they've got uh, a lot of investment. They, uh, well, invested themselves already into it, time and money. They wanted to make it happen. And we've all been waiting for some regulations from the government. Now, 18, 19 days ago, they said, right, clubs can open, but it's 300 capacity, 75% uh, of people allowed in at a time, one meter distancing on tables. But we're going to announce something really positive every two weeks. We've been waiting. 18 days later, we got an announcement. It's actually gone backwards. It's now 30 people inside and 70 out, all with masks on. Mm. So people like myself and many other promoters that I, I know and work with um, have just been waiting and waiting and waiting. But... I think now we're getting a bit more realistic. Um, mm. There is possibly opportunities uh, to do other projects. I mean, I was going to start developing two or three things I've been really sitting on. I thought this could be the opportunity this year, namely um, 
Rave of Tots, the UK's biggest family rave. Um, I had uh, licensed that for Spain, which I was very, very excited about. Um, and we were going to plan doing like family parties in Ibiza, but we, there's no dancing, so we can't even have a kids' party. Um, and I started a brand called Bellerica a couple of years ago, and it's very much more of a chilled kind of vibe. Um, and we were going to bring that forward more this year. We never really got to develop it because we were so busy with Defected Shine and, and all other projects. So I had very much been planning to develop a couple of things. Now I don't think we can even do that. I think you even need to wear masks on boats. So I don't even think boats are, are that exciting proposition now. And I think realistically, I'm going to go back to the drawing board and uh, really develop a couple of new projects for next year to add to what we already do and kind of use the time productively. Mm. Interesting. So ne next year, again, it's, it's, this, it's the fear of the second wave coming or something like, you know, for next year. So it's just, I guess we're just playing it by ear now and just seeing what can potentially be worked on for even 2021, I suppose. And what we need to do realistically is go ahead hoping that next year is like last year. Yeah. Um, but bearing in mind, you know, the life lessons we've now learned in the last few months that unfortunately it might not be the case. Um, you know, right now, if things just carry on as normal, we'll be back with uh, Defected, Shine, Garage Nation. We'll bring Raver Tots in. We'll be doing our one more time holiday. Um, the Kevin and Perry 20 year birthday, which we put together. I yeah. mean, honestly, this was the fastest selling show I've ever done in Ibiza. We'd, we'd sold a couple thousand tickets. It was en route to sell out amazingly. Um, we, we'll have to move that into next year because everyone still wants to do it. Um, so trying to be, remain positive, we've already got five or six really strong projects, something over Mallorca too. Uh, and I hope we can deliver that. If, um, if for whatever reason the clubs can't operate on that level, we've now got time really to then go, well, that can go into an outdoor venue or that could go onto a boat or we just scrap that. Don't worry, we don't need, you know, whatever. But the problem is they tell us so late in the day. And yeah. I kind of understand when we're fighting a virus, you kind of don't know until down the line. They can't tell us in January a law and then the virus hits in May. You know, they need to wait until May to tell us. So I'm just worried we're going to be wasting our time again, but we really have no, no other position here. We, 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 we just have to wait. <laughs> So, yeah, yeah, no, it just it seems like a lot of businesses and people in this position are like positively trying to use the time to develop other aspects. It's like us with our online membership. It's something we've genuinely wanted to do for five years. Mm -hmm. And it's just like we've pushed it off, pushed it off. And now, because we've had to, it's like we're diversifying. So there definitely can be positives in this because... Other times, if you let it affect you, it can be quite negative, the whole kind of, you know, the doom and gloom of it all, especially when it comes to having, I mean, we had a really big year planned out this year. We started it off with a live event in Glasgow, mm -hmm. sold it out, done amazing, everybody showed up, and then we were like, wow, this, you know, we've, we're onto something here. The world yeah. shuts down, you know, and you had 72 oh, events, man. Amazing. I mean, Jesus. I know, I know, no, it, it, what can you say or do? I mean, the only thing is about then developing new projects. I don't want to spend the next seven, eight months working as hard as I did the seven, eight months into this summer and then seeing that will get pulled as well. Yeah. Um, I think in some ways um, it's nice to use the time to develop yourself personally because, you know, you're in a business like I am. We spend probably 90% of our time really working in the electronic music business. Obviously, family time and stuff like that's very important also but we don't actually focus on ourselves that much. And I'm not one of those wellness types going to be like, oh, we now need to look within or whatever. But, um, you know, it's nice to use the time to make a few improvements to how you're living and things like that. You know, pick up a book, maybe write a book, pick up Spanish that I stopped learning 15 years ago, ridiculously, even though I live in Spain. Yeah. I went for my first jog in a year the other day, um, spending nice time with my boy and stuff like that. So, you know, th those are the real kind of positives. All those things probably wouldn't have got done if this didn't happen. Exactly. But if we get back on track next year, you know, th that's an important thing. Um, and, and I'm really kind of confident, staying positive, that we will be able to get back to where we were. You should uh, pick up the pen and paper and start writing that book. Thinking that. That would be... That'd be uh, you just get out some potential ideas for that. That would be pretty exciting. Yeah, the problem is, if I write a book, it, it, it's going to be full of quite very funny stories over 20 years in Ibiza, but... I wouldn't really be able to pen my name to it because I'd never be able to work in this industry ever again. Well, you can so, just uh, make up names and stuff. You know, if you've ever read Kill Your Friends, 
you know, and it's like, uh, you know, about a music manager who basically was naming and shaming everyone, but using different names or, you know, so maybe you could do that. I'm aware, I'm aware of the book. Yeah, could, could, could write fiction. It would literally fit, look like fiction, some of the stories. No, I really like the Secret DJ book as well, um, which kind of did that, really. It was very honest, but obviously you kind of change your names around because all these people still work in the industry. Yeah, exactly. uh, I think, yeah, one day I would like to do that for sure, but I feel like I might have more interesting things to tell in another 20 years, maybe. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I'd yeah. be surprised, though. You'd probably be surprised, man. Like, you know, it's just sometimes just getting things out there because if you do one now, 20 years later, that's the next book, you know what I mean? It's like, get a couple of guys. Yeah. <laughs> well, maybe, well, look, I'm very lucky. I started in Ibiza around the year 2000 when, um, you know, Manumission was at its peak. Wow. Uh, trance was huge, you know, Cream, uh, Gods, um, Armin coming through, Tiesto. Uh, I had some fantastic nights out and stories, and um, I was very lucky to get here at that period, I think. I, I really, I know it's a bit of a cliche, you always look back and go, it used to be better then, but this was just unrivaled, probably because I was 18, but yeah. also it, this is an era that just will never be repeated ever again. Um, so I'm very lucky to have lived through that. Yeah, I've probably got a lot of stories to tell from that. Probably most of you have heard my stories when I'm drunk in a club at 6am. I've, I've, um, I've heard a few. They're probably had some good ones in Amsterdam. But um, yeah, maybe one day I'll, I'll write the book and uh, you guys can write the film score. How's that? Definitely, that sounds good, mate. So see, <laughs> what was your inspiration? You mentioned you, you came out, it was the year 2000, was it? Yeah, I mean, look, it's, it's quite a funny story that I've told a told a few times on podcasts lately, but um, I grew up in Cornwall. I was very much a rock indie kid, loved Britpop, had no interest in dance music whatsoever, really. It, you know, it, it was on the radio, but I didn't really listen to it or buy it. Um, and you don't really get dance clubs in Cornwall, uh, obviously. Um, and one of my best friends was like, I'll pay for you to come to Ibiza if you want to come. I can't go with my other friends now. I was like, Ibiza, it's that dance music place. All right, it was paid for. And uh, I was 16. And um, my first night was at S Paradis for Clockwork Orange. And you know, I queued for, I don't know, honestly, two hours to get in. And um, suddenly, brand, you know, these old Brandon Block, Alex Peer throwing vinyl across the dance floor and house music going off. And there's about three, 4,000 strangers hugging each other. We're all running in the sea afterwards. And I was like, wow, like, what the fuck is you this? You were baptized. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what? I've never looked at it like that. I got baptized in the sea after cut the You baptized by Abitha, man. But um, I, uh, you know, 16 came on holiday, 17 came on holiday. And at that point, I really kind of realized there was a business behind music. Because I'm not creative, as you know. I'm not a producer, DJ. I'm not a, a musician. But I was actually quite interested in the whole business behind music. Record companies, artist management, PR. And I wanted to go to uni, and I found a music business degree. Um which was very unique then. It was at Buckinghamshire Uni. It was called Music Industry Management and Marketing. And I thought, fucking great. The governments are giving out loans. Um, I'll borrow 20 grand and go and spend three years learning about the music industry and try and end up, you know, an A&R or something for record companies. But um, during those... Cause I then got a taste for Ibiza. I wasn't still a massive dance head, really. But I thought instead of going to Cornwall during the summer and getting kind of quite mundane jobs... I might as well go to Ibiza and have some fun and, you know, enjoy the island. And I kind of got sucked into the vacuum of Ibiza, really. And I finished my degree, did really well in it. But I decided, you know, although I love this kind of more guitar based music, there is a business um, away from it in the electronic world. And I kind of uh, automatically or by mistake kind of climbed some kind of invisible Ibiza ladder from being a flyer on the street, literally saying free shot of your first drink, um, to, you know, within a couple of years, becoming promotion manager of Mambo and Savannah, which was a, a great opportunity. Working with some great people. My boss, Rob, was fantastic. And Javier Anadon owns that strip, many other things. Absolute don to learn from. Um, then went to launch, uh, relaunch Kanya, uh, where I got to work with a guy, Mo Chowdhury, who was the boss of Prima Bitha and, um, you know, he, he was my Don, really. And then from there, uh, you know, Tiesto, Radio One stuff, and then ended up working with Cream full time. So, but quite a story, really. But it, it'll take a long time to go through it. <laughs> it's amazing. That's why you should write the book, man. Aye, it's proper, like from the ground up stuff, you know. And 
I guess that's what everyone who goes to Ibiza for the season, especially those who have got their heads screwed on, you know, they're not just going to completely party, you know, but, you know, those who want to climb that ladder, that's really on paper what, what they want to do, isn't but, it? Yeah, progress. yeah, and it shows you the level of commitment, though, as well, because you will see people that maybe want to make it as a DJ or a promoter, and, and, and they won't invest. Like, you took a 20 grand loan out, there's loads of risk involved with that. And it's like most people, when they're taking out money, they're buying clothes, they're buying cars. It's like, you know, they're not doing something with it. I think you looked at that and said, I need a slingshot to get myself started, Mm -hmm. get over there. But with a a goal in mind. Mm. And that's awesome, mate. That's so cool. I kind of realised, I mean, maybe it's because I wasn't that massively into the dance music scene whilst I was working out here. There was a bit of an opportunity because there were way better street PRs than me. um, Way better. Um, But they... They were proper party heads, you know, they were here to party and go on a sesh and yeah. I really wasn't. I, I quite liked earning money and I kind of thought, well, if I work hard, I, I can, you know, get from PR to PR manager. Then as PR manager, I can go be PR manager of another bar, which is better and earn more money. Yeah. And that's pretty much kind of where it went. And along the way, of course, I did fall in love with the club scene. Um, but I found a really nice way to balance kind of having a career and having a really nice lifestyle as, as well. Um, but then when I started working full time, you know, for the bigger things like Tiesto at Privilege, which was a beast, doing the Radio 1 shows and working for Cream, it then very much became, you know, well, we're, we're now really involved in major businesses. We've got targets to hit. We, I need to be banking 100,000 every week without fail so yeah. I can have a little party at the event. But we've got major commitments and a lot of pressure here. And that's when it became apparent. This is a, this is a really big business. we you know, we're talking about companies that are worth millions, companies that are worth billions on stock exchanges, Live Nation, whatever. We ended up between being a, a tiny little part of. Um, and it was a real uh, eye opener from being a flyer on a street to suddenly within a few years being, you know, uh, a cog in a wheel of like multinational companies that operate on such a scale. What would you say, like, a key trait? Like a, key, a key personality trait that, that sees you through that kind of build. What what's the thing that kind of you see you through that? You know, in terms of building relationships. You know, that... I, I guess it's just got a bit of ambition and drive. I mean, I don't know. I, I, from from the age of eighteen, I've always felt I've always wanted to better myself. You know, always further myself. I've always been ambitious and driven. Um, and I think it's that getting out of bed in the morning. And the first thing you think is like, you know, right. What what more? What more can I do today? How do we move forward? Um, uh, going to bed, you know, thinking about things. I, yeah. I don't know. I can't really switch off. I'm not someone who just sit by a swimming pool and read a book or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, so for me, that's the most important trait. I think you need to get on with people. Obviously, I mean, it's funny saying that because most promoters have a bad reputation. A lot, of the, a lot of them have egos, um, <laughs> myself included. And um, <laughs> you, end up, you end up falling out with all of your rival promoters and all the venues you work in. It just happens over time. Yeah. But it is a people business. You need to be able to sit down with people, look them in the eye, shake their hand, negotiate deals with them and work with them even if you don't see eye to eye. And I'd say that's a very important trait I think promoters um, and DJs need to have if they're going to make it in the business. Yeah, definitely. Well, is, there, is there any moment in particular, Nick, that like you'd went from this wee guy throwing about flyers and having a bit of an idea to then working with these brands and stuff? Was there a moment where you were like, oh shit, I'm really doing this? Like, you know, like, so. you know, whether it was meeting an act where you felt like a bit starstruck or you were like, wow, I never thought I would feel that. Like, just that realisation where you were like, oh my God, I live in Ibiza and I'm doing well, you know? Do you know what? It's, it's really nice and rewarding that I've had that feeling many, many times along the way. Um, now you ask it, just thinking back to one point. One of my earliest ones really was when we, um, we did Tiesto at Privilege two times in one year. It was literally the world's biggest DJ, the world's biggest club. That was our marketing. Um, and we did it on a Saturday and then the Monday, two days later. That's how big he was. And it was a trial for the following year. If it went well, we were going to do a residency, which we did. Um, however, I went with my boss, Mo, to the event. And um, he said, oh, I'm bringing a friend of me tonight. And he turned up with Paul Oakenfold. And we're talking about, like, I can't remember what year, unfortunately. 2000. 2000- 2007, 2008. Oh, wow. And obviously, Yoki is uh, the top of the game. And um, suddenly, I'm just sat on a table with my boss and Paul Oakenfold and Tiesto. And <laughs> Oakenfold's like, look, you know, you stay with your boss. Here. He's the best in the game. You're going to learn a lot, you know. And I look forward to working with you over the years. And, you know, suddenly, I'm just like, 
oh wow, shit, is, is this the level we're at now? And then I, I was very lucky when I came into cream management, it was a really, really fantastic era for the company and the whole scene. You know, Trance was phenomenally strong, Van Dyke above and beyond doing well. We had Calvin Harris coming through. Um, we, we'd done really well with a lot of artists we'd developed from like Annie Mack, Swedish House Mafia, Dead Mouse. And I remember um, we sold out Amnesia for the first time when I was manager. The first time I took over as manager, we sold out Amnesia quite quickly. And I remember um, one of my best friends who worked with me, uh, I went outside in the, in the car park because I couldn't even get through the crowd. I was like, what are we on? Like, and he showed me the clicker and I was like, whoa fuck I, li I literally dropped to my knees like that as if i just scored the winning goal in the world cup um and that was a fantastic moment and there's been many on along the way um you know we did cream fields at ashwire ashwire tower and uh hard rock and we did about i think it's about eighteen thousand people which has never been done in ibiza and that was a fantastic moment. Um, I mean, I was just a small part of that once again. There was such a huge team behind that. The Ashwire lot, the, uh, the, the Cream lot, um, obviously. Um, and, you know, another moment that really stands out was uh, I had to go to Abu Dhabi to help run Creamfields Abu Dhabi, um, which was an amazing experience. Me and my boss, Scott, who's one of the best promoters, uh, well, one of the best bookers and promoters that's been in the game, was like, right, me and you, we're flying business class, we're off to Abu Dhabi. Um, tomorrow morning, you're, you're taking uh, uh, the Prodigy to Ferrari World. I was like, <laughs> what? So we, we took the Prodigy to Ferrari World, and suddenly we, we're on the world's fastest roller coaster, Ferrari roller coaster. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, honestly, it was mental. Uh, I can't remember who was with, was it Maxim? He was like, faster faster and I was like yeah because I had to look cool to him but I was shitting myself and um funny story just kind of shooting off angle a little bit they um the prodigy then went oh we want to go to Waterworld too this afternoon so we had to phone up Waterworld and say oh you know we're bringing the prodigy down and of course we got there and the local press were there and the local press didn't know what the prodigy looked like but over lunch the prodigy decided not to go so it's me my boss their manager and their bassist and the local press turned up and took a photo of us thinking we were the prodigy. And um, we had our own um, chaperone around, literally jumping us to the front of all the queues on the slides, pushing everyone else out the way and saying, the prodigy are going down. Um, but that night we had, um, we did Creamfields Abu Dhabi on uh, the, the Formula One track at Yas Island, you know, which is an incredible setting. Yeah. And I think we had from memory, the prodigy, Calvin Harris, Above and Beyond and Disclosure. Um, and I was just stood on stage kind of having a proper pinch yourself moment, like, wow, like, how, I, I don't know how I ended up here. You know, I don't know if I deserve to be here. I haven't really done anything for the show, um, but uh, I, I'm here now, you know, amongst all this. And yeah, those are the memories that really stand out when I've gone, wow, you know, this is what we're part of. Um, and I hope there's many more along the way, really. <laughs> That's it, isn't it? You know, you're, you're, you know, you're young, you're, you've still got so much left to go, and it's, it's, it's mad hearing all these stories versus what's actually going on. It's just, it's an incredible life yeah, for the, yeah. the roller coaster, essentially. Yeah, really. yeah, it's yeah. like, wow. I could just imagine some ultra fan there going, That's not the prodigy. <laughs> what are you letting them through for? <laughs> like, you know? hey, absolutely mad. I, I wish I got a front page paper, a copy of that paper, and had it above my bed. Prodigy at Dubai, uh, uh, Abu Dhabi Waterworld, a photo of me, just like my hair like Keith. <laughs> oh man! Right. Now, see, I would, I would also like to think though to go the other, the other side of this. Where have times where you've been like, oh my god, this is about to fail? There's an event that's totally went wrong. Something's happened. There's mm. been too many people, and there's been a fire alarm. You know, whatever it may be. Like, what, what has there been times where you've went? Oh no! That I'm gonna. This is not. This is bad. This is bad. You know. Uh, do you know what? I've got a few examples of this, really. Um, and I, it, I, I, it's funny facing them because there's something you put away in a box somewhere you don't ever want to open again. Uh, I had probably the worst event of my life. It has to be the worst event of my life. Um, I was running a night in Leeds, and it was it was going really well. Glass House. We were absolutely smashing it. Um, and then I decided to kind of start a new brand off the back of it called Glasshouse Presents um, from Ibiza with Love. It was like an Ibiza version, but we'd bring it DJs over from Ibiza, just kind of local DJs and stuff like that. Um, 
but I really wanted to tour it. It was going to be my touring brand. And I did it in Brighton and it worked. I did it in a few places. And this club in Derby invited me down and were like, look, we'd love to do it. It feels cool. Should we do it? I was like, yeah, fuck it. Why not? And I didn't do my research. Here's a good lesson. Do your research. And we got to the club and it was 3,000 capacity. And it was 20 minutes outside of Derby in like an industrial estate. Um, it had an ice rink on top. It was mental. And we <laughs> thought, once again, the, with the communication couldn't have been very good because we thought they were going to be helping promote locally because we're not based in Derby. And it was before you could really promote well online. And um, anyway, eight people came in a venue that holds 3,000. Um, can you imagine that? And then afterwards, we had to drive to Cornwall which is, I can't remember, an eight-hour drive. And I was questioning whether I wanted to be a promoter ever again. And I was very lucky because during this era, I did really well. I was um, running a lot of big things in Leeds. Uh, you know, we, we brought Dead Mouse in, Cole Cox, Big Cream Show, Swedish House Mafia. Um, and it was going really, really well. But then at the same time, I did a couple of the shows that didn't work as well. You know, some do, some don't. Um, I, I had a difficult show with Dubfire. Um, I had a, a difficult show with Freddie LeGrand. Um, I had a difficult show with Groove Armada, strangely enough. Sorry, I'm just going to my foot, I think. Uh, sorry, I'm about to, about to, about to die. <laughs> um, and I don't think that was anything down to those artists, because they were great artists, and they're artists I was very honoured to work with. But we just had the, either the wrong day, the wrong venue, the wrong marketing. It could be a mixture of anything. So. Those are times that I, I've, I've kind of lived in fear of, of what the numbers are going to be at the end of the night. Um, with regard to Ibiza, we've actually always done pretty well with our events. I mean, obviously, Cream in Amnesia was a slam dunk. Tiesto and Privilege was a slam dunk. Um, I'm lucky enough to now work with brands like Defected, which worked really well. We've managed to make Shine um, strong. I'm sure we'll talk about that later, but that's done well. Um, and... I, I was uh, very much involved in the big Radio 1 shows for like 10 years. And we did some amazing events, you know, 10,000 people in Privilege. They were some of the biggest events that have ever happened in Ibiza. And I, I was a part of that. However, we did one um, a couple years ago and it didn't work whatsoever. And once again, I don't think it was down really to Radio 1. I don't think it was down to Cream. I don't think it was really down to me. It was a mixture of a lot of things. Um, the competition that day was insane. Um, Pete Tong was doing his first ever live thing in Ibiza at Destino. There was a huge free party on for Radio 1 at Mambo. Elro had just become the biggest promoter on the island and everyone wanted to be there. And I had a, an event that was too expensive. It was like 65 euros because it's very expensive to put on. I couldn't get the lineup, unfortunately. We ended up with a lineup that just was not strong enough. Mm -hmm. um, and our, our product just wasn't good enough, really, for, for what we needed it to be for that event. Um, and we didn't do very well. And it was the first time I've done an event in Ibiza that has been nowhere near what it should be. And it was gutting, to be honest. You know, it, it wasn't my personal money, but it was money that I kind of represented for the company. Yeah. And it, I, I felt really, really gutted. I had to go away from it and really think about a few things. And it actually kind of reset something in my mind moving forward because when I left Cream and I started playing with my own money a little bit more or working with other companies, I really decided that this whole EDM um, explosion had been very risky financially for the whole scene. You know, artists suddenly getting 100 grand instead of 10 and things like that. And I decided I want to start working more on projects where the break even's more like 700 to 1,000 people, not three, 4,000 people. I, I can't do without stress. Yeah. Um, and it's a, it, it, it then became great working with promoters and brands that actually had the same vision. We don't need to charge people 50 euros. Let's charge them 30 euros, but let's also, um, you know, have cheaper lineups and less production and stuff like that. So, so I've gone a bit around the way then on the answer. I'm just rambling now. <laughs> it's good though, because you're showing though, again, it's like so many people want to give up when they do, you know, quotes fail. You know, it's like, it's what you learn from it and the resilience of how you carry on. And if anything, it just sparked you to think in a new way. And again, it's like, as we're talking about diversifying, when, when shit hits the fan, you need to think you need to think yourself out of it. Yeah. And if you let the situation take over, then you'll never promote again. You know what I mean? So you've managed to break through, you've questioned yourself a few times, but it's like, you now know, I won't make those same mistakes. And 
the thing as well. Is yeah, I mean, the, yeah, that's true. I mean, the, the only other time that's really kind of happened, exactly like you've just said, is um, when, when I booked a lineup because musically I really wanted to see the acts. You know, I got sold yeah. something that I was like, wow, that's what I want to do. I won't say who the acts are because they're artists I work with and I respect and love a lot. And I, I, I'd probably make the same mistake again just to book them. Um, but, you know, not being a huge dance music head, I never really booked lineups that I liked because I, I wasn't that bothered. I, I was a promoter that booked events I thought would sell well and give everybody a nice, you know, great time and artists I want to work with. But once I did book a lineup purely that I musically was really into, um, and it was the first time I ever lost money, I probably lost about 10 grand of my own money, which was not a nice experience. And I learned from that. Never ever book lineups again just because you really want to have a night out, have a dinner and a nice night out with those DJs and watch their latest set and stuff. Because yeah, unfortunately, that's when you start, um, yeah, that struggling. Doesn't make sense, I suppose, when you look at it like that? Um, exactly. I was going to say, do you think, like, that obviously competition's massive in Ibiza, but they always say competition's healthy. Yeah. Do you think that's what keeps you on your toes, really? If like, a big brand like Elro comes along and you see how massive it is, does it kind of reset things in terms of? you know, how you hmm. approach it with the competition, you know? Yeah, I mean, it, to be honest, it's, it's, it's a very layered answer to that question because you say, you know, competition, you've got to consider what competition really is in Ibiza. You know, let's just say you've got seven clubs, seven nights of the week. So there's already 50 parties really happening. Um, you're competing with the fact that most customers would only really want to go to a club once because they then another day they want to go to a different club. Mm -hmm. So you kind of have to be the best party on your night of the week and you kind of have to be the best party in your club. Otherwise they'll go to that club on another day and then they're not going to come. And now you've got the other competition of people's time. Do people really want to be in a club getting hung over, missing the day on their holiday? Not really. We're now in a bit of an era where they want to go to a beach club where they can drink in the day, you know, have dinner, crack on a little bit, but they're in bed by two and they're fresh up for the day again. Um, we also live in an era now of the whole, you know, Instagram bullshit where you get, we call them weekend millionaires. They literally just want to have a photo of them with, you know, with, with a big magnum of Belvedere by a swimming pool, you know, and that's more exciting for them than a big night out. Yeah. So when you say competition, that's what I consider to be competition fighting for your best night in the club, the best night of the week, Thanks. and what people's actual interests are that they want to spend their money on now. Bringing it a bit more closer to home, like you're giving an example of Elro there. Yeah, I guess you kind of do want to become the best night, probably within your genre more. Um, using the example of trance, you know, trance has been so limited on the island that Cream really was the king of trance. Obviously, Armin was great as well, but people would come over and always do both. Yeah. So it was never really a problem of being the biggest trance night for the last few years. It more was in the past when you had judgment, you had, um, uh, you know, your gods and Crasher were doing stuff. And there was a lot more competition within your genre then, really. But yeah, I, I don't know if that answers your question that accurately, but uh, competition's all around you. You just got to fight to make people want to come to your event the best you can, really. Interesting. What do you make of what's happening with the likes of like Tale of Us and acts like that now? Because a lot, a lot of people would consider that as trance. I mean, it really is. It's slowed down. It's massive breakdowns. It's trans, uh, trans sense and stuff. But it's a whole wave of of uh, kind of people coming along and going to those shows, and it's called something else now. Really, it's what progressive or melodic, or melodic techno. techno. Really, it's, it's interesting what's happening. It's um. I, I don't know, it's quite, it's, there's a couple of ways to look at it, isn't it? It's quite nice, you can kind of feel a bit smug and pack yourselves on the back and go, all those techno guys that thought they were too cool for trance are now actually dancing the trance, yeah. but it's not labelled as trance. I think this is the problem of there being genres in music, in general, really. You've got to remember, genres didn't really exist. Genres were brought in by um, the shop HMV in the 30s, I think. So people could literally walk into a shop and nowhere to go, it was that simple. Genres are just labels that we give things to sell, really. Yeah. Um, trance obviously became a dirty word, one for a better term. Um, it wasn't cool. It stopped being on Radio 1 and stuff like that. Um, and people just decided that trance wasn't cool anymore. And uh, if you really think about it though, the actual melodies from trance are so important to electronic music that you're right, you go to a techno club now, and the minute it, that beat is broken up by some kind of trance melody, it's such a euphoric moment. No, 
exactly people love it and i am pleased that a lot of the artists are actually now feeling a bit of influence from trance into their sex um i don't think it means a load of techno guys going to go and start um you know watching uh cosmic gate or whatever you know I just came with the first name to think of then yeah. um but I, I i just think it's nice that people like all kinds of music you know like steven like for you for example i know that musically you're very diverse in music you like, music you probably listen to, clubs you go to, and music you produce. You know, you've got your other alias that you do your more techno stuff under. I think that's where we should be. I mean, yeah. I don't see I'm listening to one genre. Like, you want to see my what I listen to on Spotify? It could not be more varied. Yeah. And I think it'd be nice if people generally actually were more open musically, and they don't just listen to something because they think it makes them look cool. Yeah. Hang on, couldn't agree with that more. Well, it's, it's the whole taking a picture with a bottle of Belvedere. It's like it's there's there's yeah. not much substance to it other than looking cool for a couple of days. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what you're talking about, mate. I, I, I would never, I, I would never do this. Yeah, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but, you uh, that, but the thing is, you probably never posed with it. You just drank it. <laughs> <laughs> man, it's been it's been really great chatting to you, yeah, man, and uh, catching up because like we usually just catch up in an actual Ibiza setting, Aye. and uh, usually pre gig and after gigs, and you know you know thanks to yourself, very thankful like some of the experiences we've had coming over, and me and Stephen running the business, being good friends, and then me getting to see him on those stages. And like yeah. knowing how hard we worked and stuff, and I'm like, no, for me, that's the pinch yourself moments for me. And you guys and your team have looked after us, unbelievable. So you know, yeah, Brett, thank you so much, man. No, it, it's been great for us. I mean, you know, to be honest, if any breakthrough DJs or producers are watching this, it's it's a nice little kind of lesson along the way. I mean, I I met Stephen really on a night out in Amsterdam, didn't I? And we just had a few bevies, and then you know, the promoter introduced me to you. Um, was very supportive of you. It's like, do me a favour, please listen to this guy and give him a give him a set. He won't let you down. And I'm always more than happy to give anybody a chance. It's very unlikely. Normally, they they end up staying with us um, for for you know the, the next few years. But yeah, I think I gave you a, a gig at Cream and Amnesia. Yeah, yeah and Good. I thought you did great, really, really great. I think I get, I've now booked you probably for every year since at something yeah. in Ibiza, yeah, and it yeah. must be five six years now. And yeah, exactly. what has been good for me is it's quite difficult to find uh, a breakthrough artist. I'm sorry, I don't know. I keep using that term, um, but um, you know who could open, play a main set, or close. And you've actually managed to prove that you could do yeah. all of those for us. So it's a very safe pair of hands. And yeah, if yeah. you were here living in Ibiza all summer, I'm sure we'd have loads of work for you, mate. So, yeah, uh, well, you know. It may happen. Yeah, but it's always been toyed with. So. Maybe not this year, now. Maybe not this year. <laughs> <laughs> I've got a, you've got your banggy residency this year, mate. Yeah. <laughs> oh, but it 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 <laughs> <laughs> we've set you up 70 gigs it's all good <laughs> but maybe okay. next year maybe, maybe next year maybe next year Nick. hopefully fingers crossed yeah. but cool, cool. sound mate well uh, thanks very much Nick I think we've, we've covered yeah. scores there that's been uh, it's been great to catch up as always mate so I'm sure this yeah. one will be in a storm where, where the... yeah right fantastic thanks for your time and um, good luck for the next year or so you too all right. catch up soon mate you too, see you guys cheers cheers bye